Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series. We are presenting on fleet electrification, changing tech and teams together. Now I'll turn it over to James, who will lead us today. Great. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Really excited about today's conversation. Uh, I'll begin by introducing our panel here. Then I'll give kind of a, a brief presentation to set the table in terms of what are the drivers of fleet electrification and some of the benefits of early engagement. And then our panel here will discuss their perspective on that. And then uh, we'll welcome your questions. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of interesting questions and perspectives from this audience. So we'll try and reserve plenty of time for that. All right, well, let me introduce our panel. So first, Rick Rosa has spent the past five years uh, and more of his career with Avant Grid as the manager of electric vehicle programs. In that role, he has focused on the advancement of tr transportation electrification, engaging with stakeholders, policymakers, regulators in New York and Connecticut. He's led the design and development deployment of commercial make ready fleet electrification and residential managed charging programs for Avant Grid affiliates. Uh, New York State Electric and Gas, Rochester Gas and Electric, and United Illuminating. Thanks for being here, Rick. Next, we have Ben Yenter, who serves a variety of roles in Choose EV, including the head of sales, product designer, director of accounts, might maybe even changes the copier toner from time to time. <laughs> I don't know. Um, ben has an extensive background in technology, marketing, and the utility industry. His core strengths are strategy, innovation, and perseverance, which translate to well-positioned products and strong go-to-market strategies. He has run successful technology and marketing agencies for more than 25 years. And Varun. Varun is a senior practice consultant in our transportation electrification practice. He's one of the chief architects of our fleet electrification management offering. Varun provides expertise as well to a number of our EV charging programs. And uh, what else, Varun? Varun also is known to road trip across uh, great expanses of the West in his electric vehicle, uh, saying range anxiety, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome, panelists. Uh, welcome again to our audience. Look forward to your questions and comments. As Emily said, at any time, please drop a comment or a question into the question box, uh, and we'll reserve the last 15 or 20 minutes to hear from you. As this quote from last year's Rocky Mountain Institute report suggests, fleet electrification is now happening. And the main choices we have are how quickly it happens and how optimal the outcome is. Now, what is making that transition happen? Policy is a key driver. The federal government has been busy of late. The new EPA rule for light duty efficiency bakes in what is essentially an assumption of 17% light duty vehicle sales becoming plug-in electric. The Infrastructure and Jobs Act provided a lot of funding to EVs and EV charging infrastructure and related activities and an executive order commits the federal fleets to zero emission vehicle acquisition. That activity at the federal level is relatively recent. The states have really been the workhorses on transportation electrification policy for some time now. Over 40% of Americans live in states that have followed California's lead in adopting a path for light duty vehicles that progresses steadily towards zero emissions. Many states have now adopted similar uh, medium duty and heavy duty vehicle zero emission memorandum of understanding that aims for 30% zero emission medium duty and heavy duty vehicle sales by 2030. And beyond goals and mandates, um, some interesting market mechanisms have been introduced, uh, notably the low carbon fuel credits, which provide another source of value for making uh, electricity your fleet's low carbon fuel. Last, the rubber meets the road, uh, often with local governments who are adopting zero emission vehicle purchase policies, transit agencies are committing to reduce the emissions of their fleets. And in areas with historically high air pollution, you also find air pollution control districts who offer some 
good grant funds to transition away from diesel vehicles. None of that would be possible, or at least maybe it wouldn't make great economic sense if it weren't for the rapid advance of technology, especially in the area of batteries. The cost of lithium ion batteries used in EVs has decreased by almost 90% over the past decade, um, at least up until the last year or so where everything from batteries to eggs suddenly became way more expensive. Um, but as batteries have gotten cheaper, so too has the range of EV models that are available expanded to meet consumer demand and fleet operator needs. There are about 100 light duty vehicles, electric vehicles available, uh, including some fleet favorites now like the F-150. And in the medium duty and heavy duty space, delivery truck and bus options are now varied and other specialty heavy duty vehicles are, are available too. And, and really available, not just available on uh, trade show floors. The final area of drivers or, or really a bundle of benefits to fleet operators are the sustainability and economic forces that are moving progressive fleet managers to act. Many of you know this coming from the utility world because you were the first. Utilities like Avangrid have committed to converting the majority of their fleet vehicles to EVs. Uh, more recently, big splashes were made by very large fleet operators, Amazon, UPS, lining up tens and hundreds of thousands of electric delivery vehicles, and perhaps making a little less big of a splash, mid-sized organizations like Clear Result that operate fleets of several hundred vehicles are, are beginning to transition as well. That RMI report I mentioned surveyed fleet operators and found the main motivations for this action uh, to be very clearly first meeting sustainability goals, followed by total cost of ownership improvement and then regulatory requirements. Meals on Wheels San Francisco, who we worked with last year to plan out their fleet electrification, found that they would not only achieve the sustainability benefits that they first had as their objective, but also realize very meaningful long-term operational cost savings, which will enable them to increase the impact of their core programs. So now that hopefully you're all conv convinced that all signs are pointing toward fleet electrification, uh, we can consider why we from the utility and, and implementer world need to engage fleets now or, or maybe yesterday as in some cases. As the, at the highest level, just taking it up, it's, it's because accelerating the adoption of EVs will improve the overall efficiency of our electric and transportation system while simultaneously providing emission reductions. And together those produce big value that can be shared between fleet manager participants, utilities, and ratepayers. By engaging with fleets, we will help participants maximize their benefits by both transitioning more quickly and with optimal charging solutions, that can play out by supporting the build out of their business case with online tools, with identified funding sources, or by digging in deep to help scope out their EV charging projects that will meet their operational needs while working well with the electric grid and having the capacity embedded to manage and reduce their charging expenses. And while engaging, we also help coordinate help coordinate planning across with supply and distribution system improvements to sync those up as much as possible. Which takes that us over to the utility benefits. Here, early engagement will help maintain reasonable uh -huh. rates. This example is based on some very real fleet experiences. Um, here we're showing an image of an Avangrid Utilities load capacity map. This circuit, which you can kind of see, goes into an area with some distribution in warehouses likely to see some fleet electrification, is already at about 85% of capacity with existing loads. Imagine then a moderate sized fleet operator planning their depot, their charging in this area. The fleet manager is thinking, well, I want my vehicles ready to go as soon as possible because that's the way it's always been with fueling. Unfortunately, that would lead to the first graph shown here, where all vehicles simultaneously charge with maybe 50 kilowatt at, at, or more of fast charging, and you get your fleet load steps right on top of the peak for that circuit, greatly exceeds the circuit capacity, and boom, there's a 
big multi-million dollar upgrade requirement. Or maybe you have a fleet manager who's more savvy, who knows about demand charges and thinks, okay, I'll spread my load over as much time as possible. Then you could get the second graph. Definitely better, lower peak, doesn't max out the circuit, but it still layers somewhat onto the peak and means some higher generation capacity requirements and supply costs. Now, third, you have this sort of Goldilocks scenario where the fleet manager spreads the charging load out some while still being able to move it all off peak, does a very good job of filling in a valley in system utilization. Now, I, I do realize there's a return to be had in investing in infrastructure, and I'm not saying by any means we would or could or should avoid all investments in infrastructure. Plenty of investment is going to need to happen. This is merely an example of how we find a good balance so that it's managed, well managed over time, it's coordinated across fleet and grid needs. So we maintain system reliability, which out, without which none of this can happen. And it ultimately also delivers a rate payer benefit. This is a scenario created way back in 2007 by PNNL when they first started thinking about what would happen if we had a lot of EVs on the grid. What it shows, and others have since repeated the finding, is that you can create a downward rate pressure with the adoption of EVs, as long as you can kind of steer people to charging at times when the system is underutilized. And yes, if you could somehow manage to do that with zero investment on the grid, it would produce the most rate pair benefit. But what you see is that you still have rate pair benefits that they are resilient if you invest incrementally in capacity. And finally, perhaps the most clear cut benefit to everyone is the emission reductions. You can see in this map here, which I pulled from the new climate and economic justice screening tool, that near major freeways around ports, other transportation hubs with a lot of medium and heavy duty vehicles, the surrounding communities, typically low income, often communities of color, are suffering from some of the worst air pollution in the nation. And we all have the opportunity, perhaps the obligation to address this environmental injustice by accelerating the electrification of fleets in these areas. <laughs> So hopefully that gives everyone here a good background for why we put together this panel and uh, for the discussion ahead. So let's move on to that. So hopefully that gives everyone here a good background for why we put together this panel and uh, for the discussion ahead. So let's move on to that. And I'd like to begin by turning to Rick, virtually turning to Rick at least, and asking, would you agree with those motivations for engaging fleets? And does any perhaps rise to the top for you in terms of priorities? Yeah, thanks, James. I absolutely would agree with all of uh, those um, use, uh, business cases that you laid out there. Uh, the interesting thing about the, the slide that you pointed to um, in the different scenarios where, uh, thanks, by the way, for finding a, um, a situation at, at our at one of our utilities where our we're almost maxed out at a, uh, <laughs> on a circuit there uh, but I had to look really really hard to find that <laughs> uh, but, but uh, so you know the the important thing about that is um, and if, you know since you said there are you know many uh, other utility um, organizations that are on the call today is um, when you look at that situation, that that first occurrence where you had the peak, you know, everything coming on during, uh, you know, uh, obviously at the worst time during the peak, um, and you know, exceeding the, the rating of that circuit, um, utilities actually, uh, in order to maintain our commitment to provide safe and reliable service to our customers, we have to design to that planned peak capacity. So we have to design. And so in that scenario, that that circuit um, would would need upgrading um, in order to meet the max capacity um, of that facility potentially. If we did not do that, it, it could jeopardize you know the the the, the system and you know cause problems. So 
uh, we we would have to you know upgrade that circuit. Uh, but at the same time, while while de designing for uh, that peak load, we would also want to work with that fleet provider to obviously you know not have that situation occur uh, where they're you know reaching that peak. It wouldn't be good for for the utility, and it wouldn't be good for for the customer either. So. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You know, um, engagement uh, with the utilities is critical. You know, also um, it, an interesting point about that, that slide is that is I think probably uh, as we move into the electrification space, our worst case scenario uh, for us. Uh, we would you know not like to find out that in that large industrial complex. Um, you know, perhaps six months before or less, um, that um, there was an additional two, three, four megawatts of load because um, a customer decided that they were going to um, electrify their fleet, and maybe they had plans to electrify their fleet all along, and and utility was just recently engaged, um, and now we're. Uh, scrambling to figure out how we're going to meet the capacity needs at that at that location. So, you know, for us, fleet engagement. Now we can do a lot of predictive analysis, and we do uh, do our fair share. Uh, but predictive analysis, load forecasting, trying to determine where fleets um, or other you know high adoption areas of even light duty vehicles might occur on our system. Um, you know, have some um, have some um, intelligence in them for us that we can use to try to make predictions about where we may need to make investments in our infrastructure to support electrification. Uh, but nothing really uh, is going to give you the level of detail than actually um, engaging with customers early and finding out what their actual plans are, um, and and engaging with them in such a way that um, you can help engage them in their business plans um, and their uh, electrification plans so that you have a, a great deal of insight into you know what that customer's ultimate uh, electrification plans are over a long period of time uh, mm -hmm. so i mean over the full cycle of the vehicle replacement schedule for that fleet. Uh, the more information, the better. Uh, and the more real world the information, the better. Rick, I, that's that's interesting. And I, I first want to turn to return to one of the first things you said about the the need for the the circuit upgrade. And um, I certainly see your point. I mean, you, you, you just couldn't have that first scenario happen. You have to you have to prevent that. Um, do you see and I, and I might ask Varun this question as well. Um, do you see from examples of working with customers where there's an opportunity to kind of intercede early and control that load on the customer side of the meter to defer the investment? So, yes, but I think it, 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 it would it involves a a new a new way of of, of looking at things right so um, there are situations where uh, perhaps you know you could work with a customer and um, execute some type of a formal ar arrangement where uh, if they do not exceed a certain capacity um, you know they would be allowed to operate whatever equipment that could potentially um, you know, go beyond the peak load of that circuit or the peak capacity of that circuit. Um, and we've done that before, um, but what that entails is if if the customer does exceed that threshold, then they are kind of immediately cut off. And I don't yep. think that's going to help um, an electrification business case. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I think there's there's um, a lot of um, a lot of work that still needs to go into um, planning and designing the distribution system for um, electrification. Certainly, when it comes to medium heavy duty fleets. 
Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. We may, we may come back to that. Well, I, Varun, is there anything you'd like to add on there? Um, you know, I think one of the things that Rick touched on in terms of this being a new type of engagement opportunity with the customer uh, is really just a really important point. Uh, you know, when it comes to something like this, there may be a concern around customer satisfaction issues if they aren't allowed to charge in the exact way they first uh, envisioned it. <clears throat> but having gone through the build out of this kind of infrastructure with our clients, sometimes that upgrade could take a long time. You know, it could be that if, if the customer isn't engaged early and they end up purchasing 100 EVs, and now they want to have charging ready to go two weeks from now and they hit something like this. Uh, it could be during storm season and you know we can't get to building that circuit out for another three or four months. Uh, so that's where that engagement piece is really key. Uh, and if you are able to engage them you know, within those circuit constraints, there can be some hardwired behind the meter solutions that just cap that circuit uh, under the threshold, and then you can use software to kind of distribute that capacity amongst your fleet. Uh, so there are different kinds of solutions, uh, but I think that engagement piece is the key. Right there. Yeah, yeah. So if I could, it, so what what I heard there is um, it, there there is actually a benefit to the customer. You know, while while it might be perceived as oh this is this is going to be my my cap. I don't I don't want a cap. But you could understanding the situation if there's early engagement with the customer. Well, that cap maybe it's just a, a now cap, but it allows you to move forward with your fleet electrification plans as we make plans to then later build out additional infrastructure. Interesting. The one point I would add to that is, uh, interestingly enough, uh, I, this literally just happened yesterday, so that the timing is is you know coincidental. Uh, I was having a conversation with the program manager for the New York programs, uh, and he let me know that he had just had a conversation with the state agency in New York that runs um, the Buffalo Airport uh, in, in, in the Buffalo region. And so uh, they were explaining to him that they had uh, would like to electrify um, all airport operations, so uh, including um, uh, shuttle buses that shuttle uh, people back and forth from parking lots, mm -hmm. um, elect light duty charging for the parking lots uh, for vehicles in the parking lots, mm -hmm. the rental car agencies, um, transport vehicles within uh, airport operations, and uh, while this is fantastic news. Uh, fortunately for us, they were reaching out because uh, they they weren't really sure uh, where to begin their efforts. And hmm. that's the kind of call that you want to get um, versus the call uh, from that same state agency saying, hey, look, we're, we're going to be electrifying the entire airport and all airport operations. Um, when when can you hook us up? Hmm. So. Uh, so you know, that's going to prevent a very interesting and challenging business case for us as we move forward. And uh, so I think that's a perfect uh, example of, yeah. of what's coming down the road. Yeah, that's really good. Just wait until they start electrifying those jets, Rick, then you're going to have. <laughs> right. Um, well, so, it, I mean, definitely emerging here, you know, theme about the, the early engagement and the kind of planning insights, the, how, how important those are. Um, I want to turn to, to Ben, our, our, our marketing guru on, on the call here. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how do you start, you know, building those connections? How, how do you, where do you begin that process? I think you know it, it's there's certainly a theme here that we've talked about that relates to there, there's a combination of technology issues and there's a combination of, of, of process issues that, that need to come together. And the interesting thing about the utility is obviously the many of the technology issues we've 
we've talked about here so far are, are very dependent on load and very dependent on KWH and, and the utility is smack dab in the middle of that and has the ability to dramatically impact, influence, uh, adjust costs under, under different circumstances. And, and they want to engage, you know, again, folks want to engage early. Uh, they want to be involved in the process. I think fundamentally, the utility should be a traffic driver. Utilities should be positioned to engage early. They should be looking for engagement. They should be doing, uh, you know, proactive outreach to to begin those conversations with people. And I think that the way I look at it, the way kind of we we organize our our tools and our communications, uh, generally when we're working with utilities, is we say the the path, the customer journey should involve, you know, in looking at it in buckets, it should involve awareness, where you should have a a destination, which is generally going to be the first first place, is going to be on your website. That's where folks go for information. There's going to be awareness that you can deliver through the web, uh, through additional materials, you know, through again third-party consultants or through folks in the engineering team at the utility, whatever it may be. But basically, awareness is a is a is a key sort of that first step where you engage people. Uh, then I think it's an, it's important to to provide them with a path towards exploration. Where, where people can get in and, and look at things and say, okay, I'm, I'm interested in electrification. What does that mean? You know, what, I, you know, I'm, I'm a business guy. I don't even know what a KW is or, or a KWH for that matter. You know, what, what is this? What is, what, what, what do I need to take into to consideration? As a fleet manager, folks are used to looking at, at TCO. They're used to contemplating, you know, again, acquisition costs, fuel costs, incentives that may be available, maintenance costs, and, and again, depreciation and, and resale costs and a variety of other things, a variety of complicated things. We just need simple, simple sort of solutions, simple information that those business folks who maybe aren't the fleet manager, who maybe they're, maybe they're a facility manager, they can get in and start to understand what, what it is. And then that next step beyond, you know, again, awareness, exploration, the next step I think is validation where you get in and you have, you have some ideas where you say, hey, what, you know, what, I'm, I'm thinking this is a good idea. Tell, tell me I'm right or tell me I'm wrong and do it with either, you know, software tools to help me understand what rates are available. Uh, you know, again, that's the thing I, I, I spent, I was talking to James, you know, the other day saying how I spent eight hours going through one of our clients rate, rate schedules this weekend, their commercial schedules, trying to understand the dozen riders that, that are attached to them that, that affect or impact KWH rates in, in different neighborhoods or counties or regions, mm -hmm. along with demand charges associated with generation but not transmission or you know different there's just the, these these massive uh, bits of information people need to consume we need to bring that up and say hey you know validate your ideas get an understanding of what what ev means at a very high level what are the savings um, and so on and then i think we need to to be able to migrate folks elegantly into the planning phase and then into the installation phase and then you know if we do our job really well as utilities and we want a great healthy market, we'll then have an optimization phase as well where there's continual feedback and mm -hmm. folks are working together. And there's a good, strong communication uh, platform or system in place for, for those ongoing, um, you know, again, that ongoing optimization process. Mm -hmm. So if I were to summarize it, you know, in, in general, I think it's really important for utilities to be proactively positioned as traffic drivers in this and bringing people in, helping them understand the basics and then, you know, filtering them through a, a process that empowers them to uh, plan out a good, uh, you know, good, a good strategy and then execute it in tandem with the, with the utility to ensure they, they build the most efficient uh, plan yeah. going forward. Yeah. Well, one thing that I heard there that you didn't say it explicitly was throughout that a lot of, a lot of empathy for our, our target audience who like really doesn't know what they're getting into in some respects. You know, it's not, you mentioned the rate schedules, which believe me, yes, <laughs> agree. <laughs> um, but there's also just the, you know, like rules around setting up new services. What does that entail? Who, who bears what part of the cost? It's, it's, it's varied. And if you're a fleet operator and, who operates across multiple territories, it, it may not, not be the same either. So there's a lot to understand there. I think starting from that place of, of empathy, like know, knowing what their world looks like and how to translate some of what we know into the language that, that they can understand and, and put it into their plans makes a lot of sense. 
as well as then having uh, a journey, you know, that we're prepared to help kind of guide them along and with with tracking. I think, you know, so all that says like we need to know who who the fleet managers are. And um, maybe maybe I'll ask Varun just from the work you've done so far, who are you encountering? What types of fleets, what types of organizations? You know, what, what are the background of these fleet managers that you've been working with? Yeah, that's a great question, James. And, you know, similar to our strategic energy management work, <clears throat> when it comes to energy managers, you see the whole spectrum, depending on the size of the organization and the structure. Uh, and so when we're engaging with them, it's really all about meeting them where they're at. So you might have a small organization where the fleet manager is the, you know, operations manager and the facilities manager that really doesn't have a lot of expertise. So with them, you really have to start the journey at the beginning and walk them through everything versus a more uh, you know structured organization may already have a plan in place. And then it's just about helping them get past whatever bottlenecks they are, whether it's planning for the charging infrastructure or looking at grants. And so it really just varies uh, by organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I guess a, a wide range of, of fleet managers out there. What what place are fleet managers at when we're connecting with them initially? Um, and maybe maybe it varies. Maybe you know maybe a utility has some tools that they've adopted, like Choose EVs tools that get them to a certain place, or, or maybe they don't. But just kind of your perspective first, Varun, on the typical kind of state of understanding and particularly related to kind of grid integration aspects of fleet electrification. Okay, so, you know, there's been a shift with the very public uh, advertising of EVs everywhere, like in the Super Bowl, there was like six or seven commercials uh, with the, the Ford uh, Lightning and models like that, you know, very analogous to what fleet managers are used to using, being very publicly advertised. There has been a shift in perception. So people are starting to realize that EVs are here. Um, and, and a lot of fleet managers are starting to, and it's starting to normalize for them. But from a great integration perspective, I'd say about 90 plus percent of fleet managers are not, they don't have much awareness at all. They haven't really on through a process like this, except for maybe when they first constructed the facility. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, you know, there was a lot of general contractors and uh, organizations like that that helped drive that process. So uh, when we go to a fleet manager and say, okay, you have this plan, this is great. Uh, now we need to start planning your charging infrastructure and you may need a new service or a service upgrade. They tend, they can, get big eyes and you know wide eyed and just uh, mm. it's a different journey for them for sure. Yeah, wide wide eyes might be a good scenario because they're they're engaged and interesting <laughs> and the bad would be like this is this is too much. <laughs> Stop. Yeah, um, maybe Ben, like how is there a way that we can kind of ease the entry to that conversation to that what you need to know? I I, I think with it, you know it's it's interesting in in pulling back a little bit i'd say sort of there, there's three sort of core segments that the utilities i think should anticipate talking to right right off the bat you know again in, in organizing content providing outreach and such i think it should be designed to target fleet fleet managers who are used to talking in terms of, of miles per gallon and such there are then facilities manager managers welcome back rick uh, facilities managers that uh, are, are used to talking in terms of KWH and KW, and then there's the business people, as I mentioned before. I think you know all of them have a slightly different perspective, and and all of them require a different sort of communication tactic to get them engaged. The one thing I would say, as a as sort of a theme that that I find in my con communications with fleet managers or, or OEMs, whoever it may be, is that their you know, fleet managers are are scared of it. It's it's hard work. It's a lot to think about. It's just it, it's it's just a big scary thing where right off the bat they look at it and say this thing costs five hundred thousand dollars when I'm used to paying ninety, yeah. and and then and from there they just you know throw up their hands and say you know I, I, 
be, you know, talk, talk to the MBAs, let them figure out the, the business model and the ROI and such. I think it's, it's, it's critical to put together somewhat of a, uh, you know, again, it's hard to call it a prescriptive path, I guess, but sort of a, a path whereby you do break it into chunks that are digestible. And it's okay, let's talk about acquisition cost and let's mm-hmm. talk about grants and rebates and let's talk about vehicle parity and range requirements and battery capacity requirements and such. Uh, and then let's talk about charging equipment and the technical infrastructure, the availability of power, the opportunities, the different, you know, again, going back to one of your, your early slides, James, is looking at you know, what what is the right charging plan? Is it using 120 kW DC fast charger or is it using that 11 kW uh, you know, 50 amp charger for a longer duration or is it a series of 80 amp uh, 19 mm-hmm. kW chargers over, over a different duration and a different time? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's really you know bringing them into the conversation, helping them understand those components, and really really just exposing them to to all the things. And, and the, the biggest piece I see again in in our work, going back to the rate schedules, is really helping them. And going you know going back to looking at different charging infrastructure and all, all those different components, it really comes back to understanding you know, again it can cost eight hundred dollars to charge five vehicles over a month, or it can cost four thousand yeah. dollars on, on the same rate plan. The same vehicles, the same yard. It's just yeah. you know, really helping them understand that, and really, you know, again, putting together those those digestible pieces where you say, okay, first think about this, then think about this, then think about this, then think about this, and I think about sixty percent of that is the job of the utility, and then there's forty percent, or we can slice those those pieces of the pie in different ways. Different pieces of that are the responsibility of of whether it be you know, consultants to help them understand that journey, uh, OEMs who want to sell products and, and position them appropriately and give support to help them be installed successfully, whether it's vehicles or charging equipment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's I, I think it's just a big it, it's a big thing for people to take on and we need to break it into pieces. Yeah, I think manageable chunks makes a lot of sense and, and also that at different points you might be engaging different aspects of you know the customer organization, different stakeholders within um, about those different points. Very, very interesting. Um, Rick, I'm, I'm glad you, you're able to join us. Um, as you can tell, we're talking about kind of different stakeholders. Um, I wanted to ask your perspective on the utility. I mean, the utility is not one entity. The utility is a lot of different people doing different jobs. So in these engagements with fleets, who do you see being involved kind of at different stages of the engagement? Yeah, thanks. James, that's a great question. And, you know, actually, it, it, it really involves a lot of organizations, you know, within, within, the, within the company. Uh, and, you know, for example, the, the uh, situation I described to you yesterday, uh, the call with, um, you know, Buffalo Airport, you know, we had the, um, the key account manager uh, for that group from our organization on that call. Those resources can be very helpful. We also have government affairs folks who we work with very closely um, and in helping to, um, you know, engage with our customers. I think, but more and more as as more utilities have uh, electric vehicle uh, organizations within within their company, uh, like ours does, uh, it provides us with a better opportunity to act as a liaison, if you will, between all of the varying, um, you know, uh, departments and such within our group, and it allows us to um, not only uh, liaison but also kind of um, help other areas, especially those technical areas of the company. Um, you know, the importance of certain electrification efforts and also the challenges uh, that might. Uh, be represented by electrification of a site. It's not as simple um, as, you know, let's say, uh, you know, maybe not simple, but it's 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 not just connecting a new load. It's connecting a very unique type of load, uh, and uh, you know, and then likewise also um, informing our customers um, of the information you know that we're gathering from our our more technical teams, our engineers um, and planners. Uh, You know, in our organization, you know, we have a vision to be um, 
transparent and seamless. That's our goal uh, within the EV organization and Avant Grid uh, in the implementation of our programs. So, um, you know, for us, we'll have been successful, uh, whether it's for a light duty uh, uh, fleet, you know, public level two charger or electrification of a medium heavy duty fleet, um, we'll, we have, we'll have been most successful in putting the customer first if we are able to provide uh, transparency uh, and a seamless experience for that customer. So, um, you know, they understand, um, you know, what the requirements are. They understand um, why the requirements that we have are necessary, um, that they have visibility into the process. So they know where they stand. Uh, they know what um, lead times might be. They know what um, um, construction times might be. Uh, and we make that as painless uh, as possible for that for that customer. Mm. Yeah, in terms of goals, those make a lot of sense. And and with all of those um, different internal stakeholders, certainly not an easy task to ensure that everything is coordinated and the customer is getting a that kind of transparent and seamless message and, and experience. Uh, James, I just wanted to add, you know, to what Rick was saying. You know, what we're finding is that. As much as this is an engagement and learning opportunity for customers, it's also the same for our clients. Um, this is one of the first times, probably in a long time, that they're looking at a lot of this infrastructure and retrofitting it in a way that didn't used to occur as much before, adding new load to existing sites. Uh, so a lot of visibility on transformers and just by capacity, uh, we've already seen where our clients are starting to think about things in a different way and starting to learn or incorporate new processes that help out with their overall distribution planning and that's coming from these kinds of engagement yeah there's definitely um, a lot of organizational change involved on on both sides of this so i i understand we have some questions and i i've run over <laughs> the time that i committed to give our audience questions so um i will uh start taking audience questions and um ask me, actually emily if you could um share some of the questions with me because i'm not seeing them in the, the panel here yes i will the first question is how are utility companies working on rate codes for electric chargers to incentivize the implementation of chargers? Rate codes for electric chargers. Rick, you wanna you wanna take a first crack at that one? Sure. Um, so in the jurisdictions that we operate electric vehicle programs in, you know, these have become um more of a uh, a policy driven um area so uh, for example um uh, you know our our policy makers and regulators in um in in new york for example there's actually legislation um that's recently uh, been passed um and signed by the governor into law uh, that requires all the new york utilities to provide um uh, rate structures that are uh, that help support electrification uh, of all vehicles not just um, light duty vehicles but medium heavy duty vehicles um, and in Connecticut we've just been through a series of, of proceedings where we have uh, been you know directed to um, develop um, unique unique tariff structures um, for um, uh, uh, that mimic uh, some of the uh, rate structures uh, that we've seen kind of first coming together out in out in California, um, and you know it's it's challenging because uh, I think you know we no one is opposed to innovative rate design or rate structure, uh, and it's 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 really balancing um, you know what our systems are able to do um, internally. Uh, and and the costs and the technical requirements to implement those those types of um, tariffs. I don't know if that answers the question. 
it's interesting to see we of the you know sort of we work with probably 400 ish utilities currently and and with within those within that batch of utilities that group of utilities we probably see i guess 25 ev rate programs that, that have been uh, that, that have been implemented and most of them are pilots and they'll say you know maximum 1000 users or 500 users or or a certain number of them and some of them go back you know so several years a good good five six eight years most of them are are, are fairly recent uh, but we see people definitely experimenting and the things that come up around it they're, they're doing it for a variety of reasons I, I, I think you know whether it is actually uh, inspiring behavior you know having folks charge at certain times or not or whether it's just to know where those electric vehicles are and they're running sort of pilot programs and, and looking at the data and seeing how it's impacting the grid uh, it, it's it's interesting to see all the things that that they're looking at and all the problems as well are they in, in some cases they are actually doing them on separate meters in other cases they're uh, there's there's folks who don't even don't even have AMI infrastructure in place. They're you know automated meter infrastructure. There, there's a bunch of different sort of uh, models we've seen out there. I don't know that there's a winner yet, but it's gonna, you know it's about time for all that data to come together and be aggregated. And you know where people look at it and say, okay, we've all tried this. Now let's you know let's let's see what made the most sense and mm -hmm. and does it scale? Um, yeah, I'm looking at it. Yeah, hopefully some clear answers will come out. A lot of experimentation going on, and, and a lot of hope. And I think for good reason that those rate structures will help achieve those kind of benefit maximization scenarios that I achieve. They're they're not the entire solution, I don't think, but an important part of it. Um, I, we have more questions, so I'm going to move on. Um, this is an interesting one. So for me, it's one about timing. But the question is. How do we create a value proposition around the charging infrastructure? Because there's kind of a chicken and egg situation here of you know you need charging infrastructure out there so fleets can do it uh, can 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 electrify. Um, so uh, maybe um, I'll start with Varun just kind of um, perspective on the value proposition around charging infrastructure and timing aspects related to charging versus vehicle how does that all at what when what comes first and is there a way to do it best that we understand at this point yeah i think uh on this question comes up a lot but at this stage in the technology curve i think we just it has to be all systems go on building out charging infrastructure because that demand is coming uh just from a personal uh, anecdote, I know in my apartment complex, there's four chargers and it is getting tough for me to find a charging spot when I need it these days. And so I think, you know, when it comes, it's going to happen a lot faster than uh, we probably thought a year or two ago. And I think it just has to be all systems go right now on the build out of charging infrastructure. Yeah. It's interesting seeing trends on acceptance rates with vehicles as well with and, and getting into charging infrastructure public versus charging at home, you know, whether we're talking about residential or fleets, charging at the depot or charging in the wild. Um, definitely in seeing with, with the larger vehicles, obviously they they traditionally come with higher acceptance rates, as in they can take a, a more powerful charge. They can take those, you know, higher 150 to 300, 400, whatever uh, charges, whereas historically a lot of the vehicles didn't take those charges and therefore people were disincentivized from, from you know, again, utilizing public charging infrastructure because they just took too long. That yeah. the, the charge time is going down, you know, so like everything else, it's getting better. And, you know, with even, even with the passenger class vehicles that we're seeing out there, the, the newer ones are coming out, you know, traditionally 50 kW was the standard, which which was going to mean, you know, you were there for a half hour charging your vehicle. Um, whereas now a lot of these vehicles are, are taking the 150 kW or 200 kW chargers, these passenger class vehicles. Is the charging infrastructure available to, you know, to provide those kW for those vehicles? Sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to see that again that that component is is getting fixed where that that sort of time away from the wheel or the idle time uh, I, I think is getting reduced. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, we have a next question about um, well actually the one one I want to touch on here um, related to the charging infrastructure, but specifically incorporating storage. Um, because uh, as as Ben just mentioned, the chargers are getting faster and faster. 
the vehicle inputs you know accepted are getting higher and higher that's not always a great scenario from the utility needs to supply this perspective does storage provide a helpful buffer there are there any pilots um where we've seen this play out um maybe rick would you like to weigh in on that one sure sure i'd be happy to uh so yeah, we we actually have done a, a pilot um, at uh, one of our um, service centers um, for our um, Rochester Gas and Electric um, operating company in New York, uh, where we've uh, paired storage with um, not only the charger, but also um, the building load. Um, and so far, that's been prov proving out to be, you know, uh, fairly successful. Um, you know, one of the one of the issues we ran into uh, when we first launched that pilot was um, it was right before COVID, uh, and so um, we a lot of us start, started working from home. Uh, we've not. Our intention was to um, allow that uh, EV charging station um, to be used by the public. Um, which also got delayed. Um, so the final result and analysis on, on that pilot has, has been delayed. Uh, but certainly, you know, uh, storage um, can, can be, you know, very effective, especially when you start thinking about the amount of offtake you're going to need um, from, from the distribution system. Uh, you, know, you know, not to point out any particular manufacturer, but you know what strikes me is um, EV charging infrastructure um, that's being developed today, EVSE, um, that has battery storage incorporated into it at a small scale, can take um, um, secondary service, um, you know, and has uh, power requirements that are similar to a level two charger, uh, but then discharge um at you know like 120 kw at the rate of a dc fast charger um you know that same concept can be can be um i think you know we tend to think of um you know storage as arbitrage where you know um it, perhaps you you charge the battery off peak you know when electricity might be cheaper and then you discharge it during the day to avoid uh you know uh, peak demands, uh, but you can you can charge the battery at a at a lower uh, power and discharge it at a higher power. And I think that's something that really needs to be um, looked at more closely and, and evaluated because I think there's certainly others there that are making a business case around that. So yeah, that, uh, no, that's really interesting. I, I've never heard it quite, put quite that way, which makes a lot of sense, the kind of low power versus arbitrage choice that you have with storage, as well as, as you noted, <clears throat> a few different, uh, a lot of different scenarios that are playing out in terms of the integration of, of storage, either in the EV itself, in some sort of charging and building scenario, or I believe um, like Electrify America is, is adding storage in, in a lot of their char new charging deployments I've heard. Interesting. Um, actually, another one for you, for you here, Rick. Um, the 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 transparency. Um, I think you know that probably resonated with a lot of folks here on how can we be transparent about what's needed, communicate that well. Um, what, to your mind, is going well so far, and what could be better? So I I think the the thing that's going that's going well um, is uh, our ability to communicate with with customers um, early, often, uh, and consistently. Uh, so we want to, you know, we we want to make sure that we're delivering, um, uh, you know, a clear and and consistent message when we um, talk to customers about um, interconnection with the distribution system um, and what that process entails um, and again acting as that as that liaison um i think you know what could be done better uh, is to have um uh additional um organizational alignment around electrification uh so to the extent that i think 
um, organizations, utilities. Um, it, it doesn't, I don't think it matters if you're uh, a, a utility or, or a, an entity that's looking to electrify a fleet. Um, you know, you need to have organizational alignment um, toward that common purpose and towards that common goal. So, I mean, um, as I said, I think electrification um, in some areas of, of the organization is seen as um, high priority, um, whereas um, in other parts of the organization, it may not be as high a priority. And I think those priorities need to be in line. Mm -hmm. um, in order to have that transparency and that seamlessness uh, that I spoke about earlier. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Big organizations take time to change, and uh, you know, I think a lot of that comes from from leadership. I I realize we are we are down to our last couple minutes here, so hopefully we got through a lot of the questions that you had. If if uh, we didn't, I apologize. We'll try and get back to you in another way. In our last two minutes, um, I'd just like to ask uh, each each panelist to kind of kind of concluding thought, like if if there were one thing that you thought we should be doing more of today, um, helping customers with fleet electrification or in that related area, um, what would that be? And I think everybody's got 30 seconds. I've, I've got my timer here, so you're on the clock, starting with you, Ben. <laughs> So I, I think the, the most important thing, everything we've talked about today is about engagement and, and talking to folks early and putting together processes that lead to success. And I, I think that's that's really important. The one thing, as a guy who's worked in energy efficiency for, for many, many years and has watched many, many dollars spent on market transformation programs to clean up markets that were improperly developed originally, I think this is another one of those opportunities we have to do it right the first time. And I, the, the last thing I want to do is to be taking ratepayer dollars 10 or 20 years from now to clean up an improperly developed market. So I would say, let's get things organized. Let's put together processes, paths to to, to success and, and execute. Wow, that's great. A lot of pressure on all of us. Uh, Varun. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important to uh, to contemplate the fact that our journey or the utility journey is kind of mirroring the customer journey in terms of change management being very necessary, a lot of transparency, like Rick was saying, and thinking about this holistically. So I think that's one of the best things we can do is, is think about it in that way as we start to create solutions for customers. All right, excellent. And Rick? Yeah, Ben, tough, tough act to follow there, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, you know, um, I was thinking about how I would follow Ben, and, and I think that um, you know, when we talk about, you know, failed markets, it takes me back to the conversation that we had earlier about, um, you know, uh, rate design and, and no, no, you know, clear one, one path forward. And, and I think, you know, from a utility perspective, uh, I think that, you know, from a, from a policy perspective, there seems to be a lot of pressure um, about rates. Um, but when you look at electrification, and you even with the initial first cost, um, even, you know, with, especially with the cost of fuel um, being what it is today, and you're able to educate uh, fleet owners um, that there is a clear path forward and there is a clear BCA uh, for their organization. And there are savings um, to electrification. It makes good business sense to electrify um, and that we that we don't focus purely on rates um, as, as a medium to get people to electrify, uh, rather that we educate them on um, the simple facts on total cost of ownership. Mm. That's great. And I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Uh, thank you all very much, uh, our, our esteemed panelists here. Thank you for taking the time, sharing your perspectives. Um, thank you to the audience for joining today and the great questions. We look forward to opportunities to engage with you all on this exciting topic so we can all help customers and, you know, all of society benefit from those, those multiple benefits of transportation electrification that we spoke of. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.